بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله منش الخلق من عدمه ثم الصلاة على المختار في القدم مولاي صلي وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا مولانا محمد وبارك وسلم قال الله جل وعلا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إنما العلماء ورثة الأنبياء وإن الأنبياء لم يورثوا دينارا ولا درهما بل ورثوا العلم فمن أخذه أخذ بحظ وافر أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم Respected brothers and brothers, honorable mothers and sisters, there's a very simple saying, a very simple statement in English, in Arabic, which the ulama have mentioned. And it's a play of words, it's a play on words. The ulama mentioned, Mawtu al-alimi, Mawtu al-alam. The death of an alim is the death of the nation, is the death of the world, is the death of the universe. And they say when one alim slips up, the whole, the people of the world are expected to slip up. When one alim dies, then the people of the world are left orphans. And over the past week, Allahu Akbar, we've heard the news of many, many of our great ulama passing. And it's a sign of Qiyamah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will take knowledge from the people before Qiyamah. And the Sahaba asked, how will people go to sleep in the night and wake up in the morning without any knowledge? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will take away the ulama who carried this knowledge. And our ulama are passing, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala grant us ni'ma al-badal. Shaykh Yunus Sahib, rahmatullahi alayhi, last week, three days ago, he was, damat barakatuh, may Allah lengthen his shadow over us, three days later, he's become rahmatullahi alayhi, may Allah have mercy on his soul. I want to speak about him today because he was the teacher of my teachers. And he has a haq and a right upon me that I mentioned to you just how great a person he was. And how people like him existed in today's world. People like him existed. When we hear stories of the ulama of the past, we think, you know what? These were ulama of the past. They lived in a very special time. They lived in a time without phones, without internet. And for them, practicing deen must have been quite easy. For us, because of the level of fitna we face, it's very difficult. So we can't compare ourselves to them. No, this was a man who lived in the exact same time we lived in. He could have had the same distractions we had, but he protected himself. They say about Alama Anwar Shah Kashmiri, rahmatullahi alayhi, the great, great muhaddith of Hindustan, of India. They say that it's as if there was a caravan of the Sahaba and the era of the Sahaba was passing and from that caravan, Anwar Shah Kashmiri was left behind. And he came a hundred years ago to revive the deen in India. And this is a reality of our ulama. Sheikh Yunus rahmatullahi alayhi, he started his education from a very poor family. He started his, his education locally, then he went to Mubahirul Uloom, Saharampur. And he had such thirst for knowledge. He felt so ill. Now I'm going to tell you in relation to myself. I went to study in South Africa a couple of years ago, three years ago now. I fell ill, I couldn't cope, three, four months I was back home. Sheikh Yunus Rahmatullahi was so, so unwell, so unwell, he was bleeding from his mouth. He couldn't stand up straight, he couldn't sleep, he couldn't eat. Hazrat Sheikh Al Hadith Mullah Zakaria Sab Rahmatullahi said to him that Yunus, it's time you go home. Take a break, go home. And he goes, Nay, I'm going to stay here. I'm in whatever condition I'm in, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to complete my studies. And Hazrat Sheikh Rahmatullahi says to him, Tika to tu parare. You want to stay here? Fine, stay here. And how he obeyed this command, how he obeyed his command from that day till today, he didn't even have a house outside of the madrasa. He stayed as a student in the boarding of the madrasa. After that, he stayed as a teacher within the madrasa compound. In a room in the madrasa. He taught the Sahih of Imam Bukhari for nearly 50 years. I want to tell you just how incredible this is. The greatest, the greatest, we will say the greatest stage or maqam, a status a person and an alim can reach. In the eyes of other ulama is to be teaching the Sahih of Bukhari. And you normally get this, um, get this good fortune when you turn 40, 50, you've got good 30 years of experience behind you. And then you say, right, the other ulama look at you and they say, now after so much experience, you have the right to now teach Bukhari. He was given this book in his early 30s. 
late 20s or early 30s, and for nearly 50 years he taught it. This, this is incredible. And the, the acceptance he had, not amongst just, you'd say because he was from India, that's why we like him. No, no, amongst the Arab ulama, on one occasion, listen to this, on one occasion, he was in, he was in Saudi Arabia many years ago. Sheikh Abu Bakr bin Laden, he is one of the biggest contractors in Saudi Arabia. And he deals with all the hotels and the haramain and he's a multi-billionaire. He comes to sit at the feet of Sheikh. This is a billionaire Arab coming to sit at the feet of an Indian man who's, who doesn't have enough money to buy his own food because of the knowledge he had. Sheikh Abu Bakr bin Laden, he comes and he gives him, and Sheikh was sleeping at this time, he gives two big bags of gold. And he puts at the feet of Sheikh and he tells his student, he goes, this is for you. Sheikh, when he wakes up, say, this is a gift from me and I'm going to leave. Abu Bakr bin Laden leaves. Sheikh wakes up and he sees this huge, and it must have been worth probably millions of pounds. And he opens it up and he says, What am I going to do with all this? Every penny was given to Haramain. And he said, give it to the students in the Haramain who are studying Hifd. And give it to the poor students. And there will be many, many, many people, many people who were given Sadaqah by Shaykh secretly. Where after his passing, then they realize, oh, our money was coming from Sheikh because that door has been closed. In his last visit to England, he probably stayed for a couple of weeks. He was given, guess how much in hadaya, in gifts? 70,000 pounds. How much? 70,000 pounds in a couple of weeks. He didn't take a penny back with him to India. This is when we have money, I've seen, and we, we, this is experience of people. The more money we have, the more stingy. Generally, the more money we have, the more stingy we become. Because we, get a great, we, we, have, we have a greater love for money. He had everything in front of him. This, was, this, this wasn't just Shaykh. This was the ulama of the past. This is the kind of detachment they had. They were completely detached from the dunya. Qari Siddiq Bandi was in South Africa. The great alim, rahmatullahi alayhi. He was in South Africa. And he was given 300,000 rupees. Or to make, no, sorry, maybe for 300,000 rands he was given. For the upkeep of his mother, so I wasn't too big then. Somebody gave him the money, he took it, he said, fine, this is for this year, no problem, alhamdulillah, jazakumullah. A second person comes to him, not knowing what the first person gave, and gives Qari Siddiq Sahib one million. How much? One million rands. Qari Siddiq Sahib, he says, you know what? I've already taken 300,000. I don't need this one million. The costs and the expenditure of my madrasa has been met by the first donation. I don't need the second donation. The person says, no, Qadisa. If this is enough for this year, then with my one million rands, I'll keep you going for the next three years. So you don't need to ask anybody for the next three years. So just take the money and just keep it with you. And the reply Qadisa gives to him, Rahmatullahi He says, if I were to take your if I were to take your money today and you were to fulfill all my needs, then that means I wouldn't need to ask Allah to fulfill all my needs. And I want to stand in front of Allah, sit in front of Allah, and I want to beg Allah to fulfill my needs. This is the same Qari Siddiq Sahib, rahmatullahi when ulama used to book tickets for them, train tickets, to come and deliver a bayan. He would, de he would demand to sit in economy class, third class. And any khadims and any helpers he had with him, any students he had with him, he would make them sit in first class and say, no, you lot can live in luxury, but I prefer to sleep on the floor. Sheikh Yunus same. In his time in Madrasa, he was given a bed. He slept on the floor the whole time. His students say, amazing, his students say that he would start, he would start studying at Isha time. And he'd put his head down. And he would rest his, so this was the desk. He would rest his elbows on the desk, look into his book and just, with his pen, just turn the pages over, studying, studying, studying. Time would fly. He'd get a knock on his door. Hazrat, Fajr ki jamaat kari ho gayi. Hazrat, Fajr time has started. People have started coming to the masjid for Fajr. Fajr jamaat has started. This, this, this wasn't unique to our ulama. This is why it really irks me and it, I find it really difficult to understand why people can study deen for such little time, check a few articles online, 
Instead, go into a study circle for a couple of weeks, come out thinking, you know what, I can translate Bukhari. Well, no, I can't translate Bukhari. I'm going to use a translation of Bukhari and I'm going to start making my own judgments of deen. No, 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 no. These people studied. They gave their lives to knowledge. He refused to get married. He went to Hazrat Shaykh al Hadith, Mawlana Zakaria Sahib Rahmatullahi house, his Shaykh. Hazrat Shaykh said to him, Mary Beti ya Mary Kitab. Take the daughter, take the book. He took the book. He sacrificed the pleasures of marriage to teach hadith. Because if once, once you get married, it's very difficult to then fulfill the right of hadith. This is why ulama like Imam Nawawi, the great, great Shafi'i ulama as well. According to the Shafi'i ulama, it's better for you. If you are going to sacrifice your life for the deen, it's better for you to not get married and sacrifice your life for deen than to get married. Even though marriage is a great sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just imagine it. Imagine refusing to get married just because you wanted to fulfill the right of a book you were teaching. This is unique. And the Ummah, I'm telling you, you're probably wondering, I've never heard his name before, why speak about him? Because in reality, all of us have been kept orphans. We've, we've been made orphans by his passing. And one of my friends, Mullah Muhammad, who was a student of Shaykh for the last two years, he says, since Zaharampur, the madrasa has started, about 150 odd years ago. He says, at the passing of every shaykh, that he had his disciple, he had the Khalifa, he was ready to take over. Mawla Mazhar Sahib passed away, he had Mawla Khalil Ahmad Saharampuri there. When he passed away, his Shaykh al Hadith, Mawla Zakaria Sahib was there. And he was there for about 40 odd years. When he passed away, Shaykh Yunus was there for nearly 50 years. So you've got two, two, two teachers. One teacher, one student. Two teachers of Bukhari. One's a teacher, one's a student. And together, two people teach Bukhari for nearly 90 years. That is, this is incredible. Until you go to a madrasa and you don't appreciate the effort it takes to even teach one lesson of Bukhari, you will not understand how difficult it is to teach the book for 50 years. 50 years! But after Shaykh Yunus has passed, Shaykh al Hadith Mullah Zikariya has passed away, left behind Shaykh Yunus. Shaykh Yunus passed away and there's nobody to fill this way. And the Ummah, honestly, we've been left as orphans. Because these ulama were very unique. And I want to speak to you. This is Sheikh Yunus Rahmatullah. And what's interesting is, and this is very casual, this isn't a speech. I just want to try to instill you the efforts and the sacrifices of ulama made, the sincerity they had. Sheikh Yunus didn't have a WhatsApp, didn't have a mobile phone, didn't have a Twitter, no Facebook. No Snapchat, no Instagram, no likes, no followers, no retweets, no shares, nothing. Yet in his janazah, my friends were there, and they said his janazah was so packed, they needed the police to stand outside Saharampur city to stop cars from coming in. Imagine for a second how big the gathering would be if outside the city the police say, you know what guys, there's no space within the city for any cars. My friends say that ulama or the people who were attending the janazah were parking their cars and their bikes miles, miles away from where the janazah was and they were walking for hours to get to the janazah. People who lived in cities maybe two, three hour drives away couldn't make it for the janazah because of the hujum and because of the gathering, because of the size of the crowd. They say between 200 and 600,000 people attended this janazah. Think for a second. We had last week, when Ibrahim Ankin Musaji passed away, we had 1,000 people at the janazah. It looked like a lot of people. Imagine having 600,000 people at your janazah. It reminds me of the janazah of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, 800,000 people at his janazah. In his janazah, Imam Zahabi writes, 10 or 20,000 Christians became Muslim. Looking at the size of the janazah. These, these, well, um, we had to, Imam Ahmed lived years ago. This is now. Sheikh Yunus was a man now. He, he, was, he, he could have suffered from the same distractions we suffered, but no. When you dedicate, and this is a lesson for all of us. When we, de- when we dedicate ourselves to something, give it our all. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show us the fruits of it. In our dunya, maybe we'll go without people knowing us. But remember, there's a hadith, beautiful hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are many people, akhfiya fil ard, mashhurun fil sama. There are many people who are very secretive. 
Nobody, know who they, nobody knows who they are. They are anonymous in the dunya. Yet in the skies, above the skies, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels remember their names. I would rather be anonymous in the earth and famous in the skies, or would you rather be famous in the sky, famous on the earth and anonymous in the skies? Let's make our choice. This was a the sincerity they worked with. The sincerity I mentioned is to Mullah Qasim Nanuti rahmatullah This is our, I'm telling you, our ulama, the legacy we have, a legacy that can't be matched. Our legacy is made up of three things, three basic things, then many, many other things. Three S's, simplicity, sincerity, and sacrifice. Mawla Qasim Ali was a very, very handsome individual. He married the daughter of a very rich man, the daughter of a very rich man. And she came with many, many clothes, expensive clothes, expensive jewelry in his company. When she got married, he said, look, Either you keep the clothes or you keep me. I am a Mulvi, I live a life of poverty. You either keep the clothes or you come with me and you leave the clothes. She gave away everything. And he said, I'll give it to the madrasa. He goes to the madrasa with this huge, huge amount. Because his father was very wealthy, huge amount. And he says to the, the accountant, the administrator in the madrasa, he says to him that a musafir, a traveller has given all this money as a donation to the madrasa. And the admin says, he says, you know what, this, this amount is too big for us just to accept it without a receipt. I need to write a receipt, I need to write a name on the receipt. He says, oh, he's a traveller, he left before I could ask him his name. This was sincerity, man, this was solid. Imam Sarakhsi, rahmatullah the sacrifices they gave, he was put in prison and where in prison? He was put at the bottom of a well, a dry well. He was put at the bottom of a well. That was his prison. Why? Because he disagreed with the leader of the time. And he has written a book in, it's a voluminous work, it must be about 20, 25 volumes. The Mabsut of Imam Sadaq, one of the greatest books in the Hanafi Madhab. About 25, 24, 25 volumes he's written this book. Do you know where? He wrote this book. Well, he didn't actually write this book. This book is a collection of the lectures he delivered from the well. His students were sitting above and his students were writing everything down. You think deen came so cheap? You think our deen, when people have translations of Bukhari in their hand, under their bugle, under their armpits, and they say, you know what, let me, inter let me interpret deen how I want? Because a hadith of Bukhari says you do this. So, no, deen has never been so easy. Deen comes through sacrifice. It comes through giving your life, commitment and hard work. Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, amazing. Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, left home to study. There was a time when Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, wouldn't eat during the day. He couldn't eat, he had no money to feed himself. And he would survive on grass. Just think. This is a man who is... His book is probably the third or fourth most famous book in the entire world, most read book in the entire world today. And he survived on grass. Imam Muhammad Rahmatullah wouldn't sleep at night. Somebody says, what, what are you doing? Why won't you sleep? He says, imagine I'm sleeping at night and an old woman in Baghdad or an old woman in Iraq needs my services. And I'm sleeping. What's going to happen to the ummah if the ulama and the leaders of the ummah are sleeping at night? This deen didn't come cheap. This deen came very through sacrifices. We need to appreciate the ulama who are in our midst. Now forget me, I'm just a bachu. I'm still Abdullah. We have many, many local ulama, many great ulama. And don't think we're only going to respect the big ulama. And this is one of the biggest illnesses in our ummah, especially locally we have is, if we have guest ulama, we'll treat them with full respect. We'll sit at his service, we'll sit at his feet, we'll say, Hazrat, koi kamu ko mujhe keh dena. give me, tell me some effort, I'll give it to you. We'll flood him, he'll give one bayan. Mashallah, give him hadaya, give him gifts, give him donations, no problem. But he wasn't the alim who was looking after you, 364 days of the year. When you have a problem, when you have a nikah, you go to your local ulama. When you have a problem at home, you go to your local ulama. There's a janazah, you go to your local ulama. Local mas'ala, you go to a lawyer. And how many of us would go to a professional lawyer, meet him in Asda car park and say, you know, we, we have this question, we have this problem, fix it for us. He'll say, you know what, book an appointment in my office. It will cost you 40 pounds an hour. The ulama, 
You find the ulama in the parking lot, ulama say, yeah, you know what, I'll stay. Five minutes, I'll wait. Any question, I'll give you the full answer. Facebook message, WhatsApp, Twitter, everything. You ask a question, they answer. No questions asked. And they will answer your questions if they can. Treat these guys with some respect. Understand that they went through sacrifices, heavy, heavy sacrifices. And deen did not come on the plate for anybody. Anybody who has the, had the knowledge of deen and carries the knowledge of deen only carries it because of sacrifice. And appreciate this. Understand this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us appreciate the sacrifice that the ulama made. Also make us, and this, is, this lecture, is all, we can also take something from this lecture. And what can we take? We can take the fact that hard work, Allah will reward. Whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a kafir. If you put in the effort, Allah will reward it. Man jadda wa jadda, whoever tries, Allah gives. Whoever tries, he will find the fruits of the effort. Whether you're a Muslim or a kafir, Allah doesn't let a kafir go hungry if he tries. You think he let a Muslim go hungry if he tries? Never, never. So work hard, be committed. But remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes above everything. And the commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is first. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us appreciation of true knowledge, appreciation of true ulama, and help us appreciate the value and the sacrifices these ulama made. Ameen wa akhru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanahu